happen. I think I did that. It wasn't me. <laughs> well, I realized what happened was that, that the 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 Zoom screen there was blocking the buttons. So I had to try to move it. And then I unfortunately took that as a, hey, you're trying to like stop the show, which is not our intention here. Welcome, everybody. This is another edition of Think with a Drink, the weekly webinar series brought to you by the Aries Foundation for Financial Education. And this week's a fun show for us. We're doing cannabis investing. Let's call it for beginners because for most everybody out there, we haven't been thinking about or maybe looking at or doing a lot of investing in it. Maybe we're spending on it, but we're not thinking about investing on it is basically <laughs> what's going on there. Right, Craig, in terms of that. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Uh, before we get into that, let's let's. Uh, you know, the Aries Foundation for Financial Education, we are a nonprofit. You can visit us on the web. It's AriesFoundation.org. Uh, Aries is dedicated to the mission of trying to help everyone have a better relationship with their money. Because whether you realize it or not, you are in a relationship with your money. And just like every other personal relationship that you might have, there are times where we get tied up and caught up in behaviors and triggers and things that act, cause us to act more emotional than we should when dealing with that other person, or in this case, our money and our finances. Paul, Craig, myself, the rest of the Aries team tries to do this help everyone take a little step back and realize some of those triggers and some of those behaviors so that you can work your way through that so that you can feel in control instead of having your money controlling you. All right. So this is a fun one. Uh, we call this Think with a Drink. Uh, the reason we do that is because we like to be more casual, more relaxed. You know, money, money matters. Finances tends to be sometimes a little daunting, a little overwhelming, a little intimidating for folks, Craig, right? Sometimes. Well, absolutely. So at the end of the day, kind of the last thing you want to deal with. Is <laughs> right. And so... And the idea here with Think with a Drink is trying to make it just add more casual... And we can't think of a better way to do that than if we have something cold to sip on. And this is a fun one for us and for me tonight. So this is sort of a, a special. This is we are drinking this evening Jack's Abbey's, and and we'll we'll talk about Jack's Abbey in a second. Uh, they're blood orange wheat. But here's the thing for me: in all the times I have been to their brewery and all of the beers that I have drank from Jack's Abbey, I have never had the blood orange wheat. Now, I know this is one of your favorites. I have had it many times. Not only is it my favorite, it's my wife's favorite as well. See, there you go. So, you know, uh, I, I am interested in, and excited to try this. You know, so for those, the blood orange wheat, uh, this is a Rattler, right? So a Rattler is a lager. This is generally, uh, you know, originally like two parts beer and one part lemon essentially is what it was that's how a rattler started out you know and then it was lemonade and then they just went crazy with all the different types of citrus that you can think of which is how we get to the blood orange wheat right mm -hmm. but this is a be supposedly very easy drinking craig is that your opinion on this something that can be so. yeah. pounded during the hot summer months yeah definitely not not a heavy beer for sure not a heavy beer uh so food pairings usually with something like this because of the citrus uh, vegetarian dishes, salads, um, sushi, uh, cheeses, specifically like feta or goat cheese, um, you know, stuff that's sweet and fruity, uh, 
citrus flavored type of things, including desserts, Greg. So any, you know, like lemon or meringue or those type of things certainly would go well with this. So right, let's, I'm going to, I'm going to try this. We both have a blood orange weed in hand. I know that because I made sure you had one. There it is. Yep. A nice pour. Okay, you definitely get the, the blast of citrus mm -hmm. with that. Oh, there's an immediate tang of of, of orange on, on, on the palate the minute it hits your mouth there. Right. But once again, a nice light beer for the summer. Yes. Yeah, I don't I I mean, I know for Jack Zappy, this has become like a major state. They originally just brewed this as like one of their one-off things, and it's become a staple now in the, in the brewery. Like, they can't get rid of it at this point. <laughs> but speaking of Jack Zappy, so those who have never been, uh, we just want to shout out a little congratulations to Jack Zappy. Jack Zappy made the top 50 U.S. craft brewers. Uh, it's a, uh, the 2022 list. They, they, they hit the top 50, which is an awesome thing. If you've never been to the brewery, it's 100 Clinton Street in Framingham, Mass. They've got a brew garden. They've got a, you know, the beer hall. It's a great place to go. Awesome beers. And a lot of times, Craig, there are beers on tap that you can't get anywhere but at the beer hall. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, they do, they do do distribution, but not everything. Not everything. So it's kind of cool to go check out what's on tap there. The other picture there, that's our boy Nick. He's a friend from Jack's Abbey. We, Craig and I did an event where we had a bunch of people. Jack's Abbey was kind enough to have Nick come and do a tasting for the crowd that was there. Uh, talk a little bit about the beers that, that he was pouring for them. Give everybody a sample and a taste. So it was great. We, we, again, big shout out to Nick. He was terrific. And we had a lot of fun with that. But you get a chance, get to Jack's Abbey. Again, top 50 U.S. brewer right in Framingham, Mass. Looks like if you want to, if you like brewed, New England's the place to be. I have a real concentration of dots there. There are eight. Eight, <laughs> eight of the breweries on the top 50 lifts are actually in New England. So we're going to have to focus on all of those. Then we can start hitting the other ones. There you go. Road trip. Road trip. Um, all right. So we are starting in a, in a fun place with this because originally we were going to do this last week, but I wasn't prepared. So we moved it a week. So that's, we were doing the 420 show on 427. Here is what's happening. But I, it's funny because I didn't know the origin story behind 420. I don't know if you know this story. I don't know. So, I mean, I, it, it could have been me. I didn't realize this when, when doing it, but supposedly this, well, it couldn't have been me. I was, I was, I wasn't <laughs> that old, but I meant, People getting stoned in the 70s. This yeah. is how this came about. This was 1971. The oh, story. Really? Yeah, the story goes back to it's called San Rafael High School in San Rafael, California, that yeah. this group of kids would meet at 420. And <laughs> they were supposedly the story, right? There's like goonies, like there's a little bit of goonies in this. They're like the story is that they would meet and go look for this this abandoned pot farm that was on uh, federal land. And they, they had a map to go find this. But but basically, you know, between getting stoned and then trying to get wherever they were going to go look, <laughs> they, oh, things wow. didn't really work out, right, in terms of dealing with that. But that's the story is that they would meet, you know, the code was meet at 420, we'll, we're going to get high, and then we're going to go try to find this, this hidden <laughs> pot farm. That's how this came about. But it's 1971. I mean, if you can believe that. I'm like, I didn't realize it was that long ago, like that it's been kicking wow. around forever. Wow. People doing pop for a long time. Oh, yeah. People have been getting stoned <laughs> forever. That's true. But I just didn't realize the whole 420 thing had been going on. So, all right. So let's get into this investing in cannabis, right? So one of the things is when we say cannabis, we're talking the global scale, and we'll talk about that in a second, about the breaking it down into different sectors. But when you look at it from just industry perspective, mm -hmm. right, they're talking about, and you can just see the scale, because this is starting in, in 2022. That's $30 billion, by the way. That's a B there in terms of sales, right? That that, that number is going up to projected in 2028 to $56 billion. Wow, they're talking about in the next four years like a hundred and forty-seven percent increase 
in in wow. in this is US. I'm talking global. Global sales. This is US alone, right? They, you know, uh, it might be one of the fastest growing industries on the planet at this point. And growing is, you know, that's it's definitely the 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 pun intended there with that in terms of of so everybody just wants to have fun, is what you're saying. Yeah, well, again, you know, there's a lot that goes into this because you got you've got all the different aspects of it. You know, it's not just hey, you know, let's go out and get stoned. There are other factors here, and we're going to break that down as we talk about the industry. But just know, I mean, there's a reason that we're sort of bringing this up. It's not like just hey, it's 420. You know, we we wanted an excuse there. So I, you know, we're drinking Jack Sabby, and the reason for that again, going back to Jack Sabby, is the only thing we had that that it's a wheat which is sort of like the weed that sort of grows. So we were sort of tying it in that way. And, you know, we didn't have any, I did at one time show, because like, somebody asked me, I did at one point have uh, beer laced with THC in one of the shows. Really? Yeah, I mean, it, was, it wasn't very good. It had, <laughs> had a great it smell, out. but it, it tasted, you know, it tasted, it, it, it had a very grassy taste to it. It was, uh, you know, but, but the smell was awesome. Like you open a can and it's like, you get that aroma and that smell. I'm like, that's great. Then you taste it and you're like, well, okay, they failed there. I mean, great smell, but it's a terrible taste. So. It didn't translate out, right? No, it didn't work in terms of dealing with it. <laughs> okay, so, you know, sometimes weed, it doesn't mean dope. You know, <laughs> that with the, the George <laughs> Carlin routine with, with, you know, sometimes shit doesn't mean shit. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Just watching him the other night, actually. Right. And so really breaking it out into two different sectors, right? So you have have THC, that's the the psychoactive cannabinoid, right? That's 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 what you get you high. Yeah. And then you have C B D, which is the extract, but does not have any of the the psycho effect. There's no there's not there's no cannibal no psychoactive drug component to CBD. Right. That's However, right. because it is still an extract of cannabis, it is still regulated in some form and fashion in terms of sales and what you can do with it and why you can't. Um, you know, it's funny. There's there's this thing with with CBD that the there's touts all over like if you go online and just look at all the stuff that that you know cbd is supposed to be able to help you with right. you know there's no medical there's nothing at this point right i mean that's the issue is that you know fda hasn't started you know going through cbd and seeing what the, the effects are it's right. one of those, you know it's like a pseudoscience at this point almost like Exa yes exactly it's a good way to put it and, and but there's nothing there's no actual it'll cure this or help that you know if, you know whether it's it's the you know arthritis or whatever none and none, none of those those benefits are available yet well i mean they're not approved for those uses they're not like I said, no there's just no it, there's nothing that says scientifically that that works right there's no research that comes back and tells you that to support that correct right there's nothing it's supporting that's something that's highly regulated and illegal yeah <laughs> but maybe you'll see some of that change but, yeah, that's possible, right? So that's the idea there in terms of going through it. And so the you know the pictures there is hemp sort of representing the CBD side and marijuana representing the THC side of the equation. Yep. Right. Okay. So then you start breaking it down further, right? So now we break it down further because we've known for a long time about the the actual medical, the medicinal use of marijuana, right? We've had that. You know, glaucoma was one of the early things, and that's been around for a while. You know, at this point right now, I think it's something like like 36 states have approved medical marijuana. Well, I guess in that respect. Plus the District of Columbia. There is some science. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been approved for glaucoma and those types of uses. So Correct. No, no, no. This is different than C uh, this is THC side, not the CBD side. Okay. So, so, so you can see, but everything's funky colors. <laughs> yes. There's trails and hazing that goes behind everything that you're looking at. That. So did it work or not work? I don't know. Correct. <laughs> then you have 
the recreational use. Now, this is where you're talking about the fun. This is why it's been exploding. This is where everybody really wants to get in on it because now it's, you know, uh, it's no longer my corner dealer or whatever. I don't know where you would get pot nowadays. God bless, besides the high school student, like I wouldn't know where you would even find it. But recreational use, right? So 18 states currently, plus the District of Columbia, Wow. Are approved. Yeah, no, no, no. So it's more and more are coming. I mean, this is something where, and we'll talk about this in a little bit when we get into the risks of this. But then you break it down between those two sectors, medical and recreational, you know, then you've got your 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 growers, your uh, companies that are, uh, biotech is the only way I can explain it, right? The people who are playing around with all the ingredients trying to do some of this stuff. Okay. And then you've got ancillary companies, people who are, you know, like the heat lamp people and things like that, you know, that, that are involved. They don't necessarily grow or sell or are involved in any of the retail part of, of it, but their products are used to support the industry. You got to have those ultraviolet lights and those plants don't throw, right? Okay? Yeah, right. No, you need that. You need <laughs> water, right? Like <laughs> yeah, all that stuff. All right. So when looking at investing in whether you, you're going to invest on the CBD side or whether you're going to invest on the THC side, you know, what are the risks, right? So we, that for us, we're always about the risk. We always want to talk about the risk. What's the risk? We understand the reward, you know, part of it, but you want to know the risk. And Craig sort of touched on one of them, you know, uh, there with the whole FDA thing, but certainly it's legal and political, right? So, you know, at, at a federal level, selling weed, marijuana is illegal. You know, at, on a federal, they haven't approved it from the Fed standpoint yet. Right. Let the state do it. You can sell it in the state, but federally, it's still against the law. So I'm not sure how that all works. But where that comes in and, and, and puts pressure on the industry is banking. Because federally, it's not allowed right so you've got some of these restrictions that go on there as far as where and what they can do from a banking perspective and while there has been some you know movement towards uh federal oversight yeah. i don't know that that's going to occur anytime soon i think you need to get more of the that, from a recreational standpoint yeah but i'm sure though if you own a business they're still making you pay federal taxes on your profits, even though they don't approve it, right? Correct. <laughs> right. That's the other part. You know, how are you dealing with all of that? And like you said, the FDA stuff, like when you're talking about CBD, how, you know, is that going to factor in? Is the is all of a sudden the, the FDA going to clamp down on everything and, 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 you know, make some restrictions? So just know, while right now it looks like, you know, there's, there's a, I don't know how to say green wave going in terms of 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 movement for this, uh, and a lot of people getting involved, and a lot of states jumping on the bandwagon and growers and all that stuff. This could turn in a blink, so just be aware that that's part of the risk. Yeah, I think the political part too is not just you know the fact of whether it's legal or illegal federally or, or statewide. I think it's also if CBD is used for things that. You know, pharmaceutical companies are putting out drugs to treat. Correct. So, so there's a little bit of a, a you know, a, an interest there for the pharmaceuticals to keep that from being federally regulated or federally approved as treatments for different things. So now I'm sure they did this purposely, but the beer has a funky color. Yeah, that's why it's called blood orange. Yeah, Which I don't know. Throws me a little bit with the color <laughs> there. Just just realizing that in the glass. All it's right, so on the label. I know I understand that. <laughs> that just the label there, right? Uh, you know, Empire and then <laughs> and then you've got supply and demand constraints, right? It's a it's agriculture. They're growing stuff. And I understand a lot of this, most of it now takes place inside. So you don't have some of the exposure to say, look, as we talk about blood orange, you know, the orange industry or some other, you know, that are being grown outside as much. But it's still agriculture. You're still planting and having to grow things and harvest them, and you need people to do that, and you need to, you know, be be aware of it. And then expanding or pricing becomes a factor. 
right? Because, you know, if suddenly if you say, look, I'm going to sell this ounce, for, God bless, what, I don't even know, what, what are they selling ounce for today? Okay. I wouldn't even be able to tell you. I don't know. Maybe the research will have to go to a, you know, go to a store, find well, out what they say. Go ahead. I would say the other issue, I think, too, is because nothing is really regulated in this marketplace is what's the quality of what you're getting and where it's coming from. How do you know what you're getting is actually a true product or a safe product? Well, that's that's the whole thing. That's why it's it, it, it. My understanding is that's what the stores are dealing with. Mm -hmm. But like you said, who knows? You know, God bless. Back in the seventies, they used to lace this stuff with all sorts of crazy stuff. If you could give me a bag of oregano, I would know. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, so <laughs> so just understand, like anything else, you know, the industry is going to have movement. You know where where you know supply may uh, outweigh demand, and then you've got cutbacks and cost cutting and lowering expectations. So it's you know this is just another factor in terms of the risk of dealing with it. Yeah, and I, and I think you also have you know something that's going through a novelty phase. You know it's big because for so long it was illegal and you couldn't do it. Now yeah. it's legal and you can do it. So you get this, like everybody jumping on the bandwagon. I see, you know, I've seen lines at the the cannabis distrib distributors. Yeah, not anymore though. You don't see it anymore. No, no. Now they're trying to find ways to get you in. Um, Correct. And with supply and demand, the prices went nuts, right? Like much more than it was before. It was even it was cheaper to buy it illegally than to buy it legally. Right. Um. But now, like I said, you're seeing that wave come back down. So, so I can just get it anywhere now. It's not such a big deal. Correct. It's not the novelty has worn off on that because more stores open, the more available it is, the more growers there are. Exactly. The same, that whole thing. You know, so one of the factors, though, to be aware of is if you are going to invest, a lot of these companies, a lot of these holdings, specifically the stocks for some of these these growers, they're over the counter. What is known as OTC that is otherwise known as penny stocks. Right. So these are generally stocks that don't have a high volume of trading. So liquidity can be a factor. You may own it and that's great, but trying to sell it may not happen as quickly if you want to just get out and say, oh, that's it, I'm done. Give me back my money. They'll be like, OK, but, you know, we got to wait for some other schmuck to come along who wants to buy it now. Well, can you trade in your stock for a prop for a stock? Yeah. <laughs> Or inventory. And, I'll trade uh, the stock for inventory. Yeah, a baggy swap. <laughs> you know, so there's no, what is it? It's no minimal capitalization that occurs with OTC stocks. Mm -hmm. So you just got to be aware of that. That you know, okay, we listed, but you know, you got to do a little due diligence there and trying to figure out what's actually behind it because they may be just flying by the seat of their pants and. And, you know, there may be nothing and they have one bad season or one bad thing happens and they may not be able to come back out of that. Right. But on the on the positive side, though, with penny stocks is it doesn't cost much to get into some of these things. And you right. can spread it around the different companies. So like yeah. said, five may die, but two may go fantastic. So you just never know. Right. And and we're going to go through that right now because that, that, that's segueing into the ways you can invest, right? So we just talked about the risk because for us, it's always about the risk first. Now we'll have the fun side, which is, you know, how do you do this? How do you, how do you invest? If you want to invest in cannabis or cannabis companies or any form of that. So you got a couple of different ways to go. This We talked about this a little bit, like the growers, the retailers, the biotech company, and then ancillary. So they sort of break out into three different things. And you have stocks, you have ETFs for those in the crowd. Those are known as exchange-traded funds. Exchange-traded funds are mutual funds that act like a share of stock. Mutual funds, when, are, when they're bought or sold, close at the end of the day. Doesn't matter when you sold it, the price is going to be whatever it was at the close of the market. An ETF chain that exchanges the sale is done like a share of stock. So if I sold it at 11 o'clock, it's whatever the price was at 11 o'clock, that's what I got. ETFs also tend to be uh, more passive, like I'm holding 
you know, the S&P 500 is, is probably the greatest example of it. I'm just got the ETF and all it does is follow the S&P 500. As far as cannabis goes, you do have some that are out there that will, you know, be here's all the top growers right now or the retailers or that type of thing. You can find them. Um, one of the companies to look at, like if you're, you know, looking to do a little research, which is something Craig and I always recommend yeah. in terms of doing a company called Cure Relief. Their symbol C U R L F. So Cure Relief again. This is probably one of the larger of the over-the-counter stocks for cannabis. Mm -hmm. uh, a biotech company, Jazz Pharmaceuticals. Jazz Pharmaceuticals. They they work in the cannabinoid you know universe. Like Craig said, trying to come up with some of those those uses where where they can fuse it in and, and have drugs that are, are going to be effective for whatever they're trying to cure. Uh, their symbol, they're not an OTC. They're, they're actually sold on NASDAQ, and that's yeah. J-A-Z-Z. -Z. Again, you want to just check them out. And then, of course, you have your ancillary. Those are companies, like we talked about, that are participating only by the fact that they supply or are a supplier to the industry, and one of them, you know, probably the best known, is your wonderful folks there that keep your garden, your garden and your lawn green. Scott's Miracle Grow. Oh. So Scott's Miracle Grow, you know, they're on the New York Stock Exchange. That's SMG, but Scott's Miracle Grow, there, I think it's called Hawthorne. They have a division that is dedicated entirely to providing the stuff to help weed grow. Wow. Who knows? It's groovy, man. That's yeah. <laughs> so a couple of questions to throw at you. First off, you know, how much of the marketplace and cannabis is actually uh, open to investment versus private industry? Like, are there a lot of companies you can invest in? Or is oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Out? There's a lot. There's a lot of individual stocks that are available and ETFs that are right. available. That you can you can find. I mean, I gave you the top, yeah. but there there's probably, you know, I mean, Cure Relief probably has a, a capitalization of of a couple of billion dollars. I mean, they're big, wow. they're a big company, wow. but you can go all the way down to somebody who's got you know a couple hundred million basically in terms of that and find them listed on 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 the over the counter, um, trading. Same thing with the ETFs. They're just going to be cannabis as an industry. Right, so they'll have they'll they'll have some sort of of segment that'll look at these are retailers, these are growers, these are producers, these are ancillary companies, and they'll probably have sleeves of each of them. And are you seeing some of the the standard industry mutual funds that may exist in some of someone's four hundred one k now wrapping some of these stocks into their portfolios? No, 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 because these are over the counter. You're not you're never going to see these in a like a retirement but the etf maybe at some point but only if you had a plan that allowed you to do brokerage so you so need you, a broker to actually help you find these stocks individually or right if you're in your retirement well, you asked about the retirement plan the only way that would work in the retirement plan is if i had access to brokerage there's there's some plans that do allow you to have i have offset and have your own brokerage window in which case you can buy anything you want not what's in the plans lineup in that situation so in that but you still couldn't get to the otc stuff they wouldn't they, i doubt they would ever let you open that window well i remember that like i said they were trying to integrate some of the bitcoin stuff into 401k plans so i didn't know this actually being a more stable product than bitcoin if that was something that you see linking in at some point but yeah i mean it's it's an interesting concept i will say that you know in, uh, in terms of going through it uh certainly uh, when you're looking at plans that do have those, you know, because you're never going to want to put a ton in there anyway, but, but you know, that have um, those cyclicals and commodities and other things like that that are, you know, higher risk mm -hmm. uh, positions, global real estate, you know, REITs and those type of things inside the portfolio in the retirement plan, you know, this sort of fits in there. You know, what's the difference between having the Fidelity biotech sector and having a, you know, a cannabis ETF? Like, you know, I mean, 
They, I, I agree. I, I think that is something that's interesting to be looked at as far as, as, as the ability to add it. But the same idea, you wouldn't really put a ton towards your portfolio with this when you do it. Well, and what about uh, as far as like commodities? You see it being traded as a commodity as well, like oranges and wheat and other type of crops like that? Or is No, not at this that? point. No, you don't have contracts on that as far as deliverables at this time, um, mainly because I don't believe... Uh, one that it's it's listed on the CBOE, that's the Chicago Exchange that handles all of the commodities um, to do that. And I think it would be harder because, like we said, it's not federally regulated. I don't until they get to that. I don't think they could do it. Well, you also said the crop size is probably not as susceptible to. But generally, because most of the growers are inside, right? right. You know, they're they're so you don't have a lot of that. But and also they're not. You know, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't know how to answer that because I don't know that the farmers, you know, a lot of times you've got individual farmers who are selling, they're selling contracts based on, you know, what next year's harvest is going to be and where right. that's going to go. I don't know that the industry is to that point where they're set up to start doing that. Right. But lots of possibilities in the future for this particular. Oh, yeah. I mean, you certainly if you get to national legislation, right, you, you know, if it's federally recognized and every state in the union suddenly has, you know, legalized recreational marijuana, well, you're going to need to have those. Then you're in that situation. Now it's like, OK, wait, <laughs> I'm going to be planning two years out here. My pot shop needs to, you know, I got to have that weed. I got to buy it now. Right. Now I got to decide if I'm playing corn or playing wheat. Please. All right. But, you know, that's that's part of it. Right. That's that's the conversation. You know, almost all of the farms that were tobacco are now weed. Oh, okay. yeah. The tobacco farms, a lot of them are no longer, you know, they don't they don't produce tobacco. And not all of them, like certainly tobacco road is still tobacco road. But I mean, in just other parts, what you're seeing is a a curtailing of the planting of tobacco and, and more churning over some of those plots and land mm -hmm. for weed production. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Thanks, man. Yeah. All right. So now this is a fun one. I did I did this. This was me. I did that. You know, I was having fun with it in terms of so I got Charlotte's web. I thought you you put Cheech and Chong in here for some somehow or another. Somehow or another. But so a smoking van or something going on. But th there's a reason for it with okay. Charlotte's web. Charlotte's Web is actually a holding company. It is probably the largest CBD stock holding, CBD manufacturer uh, in the universe, Charlotte's wow. Web. Wow. Um, it is all hemp derived, so none of the THC stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find it. CWBHF is Charlotte's Web Holdings. Mm -hmm. But it's, so it's actually a CBD. This is the other side, right? So this is I'm going away from the medical and the recreational marijuana stuff. This is all CBD, but this is probably the largest one that's out there. You can find others absolutely and do your due diligence with anything, but that's why. Yeah. And then drum roll for Craig. Because he, won. he asked for it. He got it. Yes. Jin Chong up in smoke. God bless. This is the 70s too, dude. So, you know, or know. the early 80s, maybe. I mean, late 70s, early 80s. Well, I had a few movies, but yeah. Yes, but the original, the original Cheech and Chong. God bless. I mean, <laughs> it goes back a long time. For those, you know, you'll have to Google it for those in the yeah. audience who would be like, <laughs> what, are these old, what are these old dudes talking about? Like, that's, you know, Cheech Marin now is like a serious actor, you know. He he does these roles now. Oh, he's like a it's like a Jeopardy champion too. So obviously, it didn't hurt his brain. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so the summary, right? So uh, you know, when we're talking about risk, like which is what Craig and I always talk to everybody about, right? You should never be putting a lot or you know, a huge bulk in anything, whether we're talking about Bitcoin, whether we're talking about marijuana stocks, whether we're talking about the S&P 500, you know, it's always an idea to be thinking I'm, I'm diversifying and I'm, I'm allocating myself out 
that, you know, okay. And like we just talked about, like if I wanted to build a portfolio and I was going to, I want to use some of this, maybe I'm taking a, you know, 5% or so max, maybe 10, but that's getting a little out there in terms of the risk factor with that, you know, and you want to base it off of some due diligence there. Like, like I said, I gave you Cure Relief just because they happen to be one of the largest. Their right. capitalization, they're probably not going to go. If anything, they'll probably be start consolidating and, and and chewing up some of those smaller producers that are out there just by the nature of that's what happens. Right. So you don't want to be investing too much into, you know, a fly by night or somebody who, you know, if they, if they get burned on the next project, they, they're out they're up in smoke. Well, you have a new industry starting and you're gonna have big players that are gonna look big and they may not be big later on. And yeah. you may have small players that will fight out or may make it bigger. And you have no idea where, when an industry starts, it morphs a lot. I mean, that, look at any you know tech, you know, ask Bill Gates. <laughs> right, and, and we talked about that you could go if you just wanted to, what, what is that? Dibble the toes, dip the toes, dip do the that. Water, yeah. You know, maybe it's it's go with some of those ancillary companies. Like I said, Scott's Miracle Grow. Come on, I mean, you know, it's Scott's Miracle Grow. You know, you, you you can certainly go there in in terms of of all right, I'm participating. Find the companies that make the heat lamps. Those, you know, they. I'm telling you, those are going to be another factor because. They, those they need to be on all the time those lamps so you're kind of investing indirectly in that way right because you're not exposing yourself to the absolute risk of of i'm buying into the market now if you want to get take the risk and buy into the market go ahead mm -hmm. you know but but just be aware as we talked about there are factors and risks that are coming that may not be at the industry's door yet and that won't come maybe not until we get closer to that federal regulation. And then all of a sudden, all this oversight is going to come into place. And that can, you know, really cr crimp and, and hit them with a cost that's not factored into their current operating expenses. So we shouldn't do like gold, right? We shouldn't be buying this in bullion and putting it in our safe. So we shouldn't be like stocking up on the gummies. <laughs> no, because the gummies don't last that long, dude. No. <laughs> No, the gummies aren't going to be worth anything in three years. It doesn't work. You keep an inventory on this stuff. Yeah. Is, no. Okay. You got to turn it over. Okay. But for anybody out there, if you ever have any questions, you ever have any concerns, you want to go through this. You want to say, "Hey, look, I'm thinking about this, or I'm, I've got questions on this thing or that thing." You know, just know you can reach out to us. That's why we're here. Like we said, the whole idea is trying to help everyone have a better relationship with their money. That's what we're trying to do. You can shoot that QR code if you're if you're watching this on, on the YouTube channel or on the website. You can shoot that QR code and that'll open up our calendar and you can book a time and we're happy to have a conversation with you. Whatever's top of mind. It doesn't have to be Cheech and Chong. It can be anything <laughs> in terms of going through that obviously we will talk about anything so <laughs> yes so what's on tap we keep the think with a drink theme going mm -hmm. next week we are going to do since it is may and it is early may the adage has always been sell in may and go away um this year it does not look to be the case uh, and history has shown us that this thing works. It doesn't work. You know, there's a little bit of iteration. We'll talk about that. But this year specifically, I don't think this premise holds water. Okay. And I'll we'll go through that and talk about, you know, some of the iterations and what's going on right now and why that may be the case. On May 11th, this is National Disability Insurance Awareness Month. Uh, so we will talk about disability insurance because Craig and I, at our hearts, at our core, are planners. Mm -hmm. And everybody needs to make sure they have the stuff in place should that situation or thing occur that causes you to miss work, miss income, not be able to do things. And, you know, we think disability gets overlooked a lot. And so it's We're one of those things about offense. They don't want to talk about defense. 
Yeah, everybody wants the, you know, let's talk about the marijuana stocks and Bitcoin. Let's go there in terms of it. So just because it is National Disability Insurance Awareness Month, we will be be doing that on the 11th. But if you ever have any questions for us, again, you can visit the website. It's ariesfoundation.org. You can email us, info at ariesfoundation.org. But you, the easiest and best thing is to just shoot the QR code. It's going to open up our calendar and we're happy to have a conversation with you. On that, Craig, I am fighting my way through the blood orange wheat. It was okay. I will give it that as far as a grade, not something I would choose to, to be drinking on a regular basis, but I know this is one of yours. So I will say skull. Cool. Oh.